RBGFM, locals talking to locals. He's a very busy man as our Chris Farfoy, of course Labour Mana MP, but Minister of Consumer Affairs, Minister of Civil Defence, Associate Minister of Immigration. How many more jobs is he going to get? But he's on the telephone line just for a few moments. Come <laughs> That's on. enough an hour, I think. That <laughs> <laughs> when I look at those portfolios and what's happened in the civil defence area, you're really being pushed to the limit, haven't you? Yeah, uh, um, we obviously don't want to see events happening, but um, as they have in the last uh, month with both uh, Cyclone Geta and Cyclone Fihi, um, uh, we felt some of the uh, effects of that last week. Um, it's um, keeping us busy, um, not only just responding um, to uh, the bad weather, but I guess thinking long term about um, the effects of climate change and the extreme weather patterns that we're seeing now. Um, you know, I think you know what we saw on the Kapiti Coast, um, on the Centennial Highway, uh, the disruption that caused to making sure you know some of the uh, the roads uh, and, and key infrastructure that we've got in coastal areas you know uh, thinking about how we can make them a lot safer and and the catchphrase at the moment a lot more resilient yes i always say uh, climate change fair enough but mother nature is the one that controls us doesn't matter how much we try to protect the uh, environment mother nature is going to take control of this when you look at the north pole there with all that ice and uh, the course of the big storms up there you know is it our climate change uh, is it our environment and the way we look after it causing this or is it just part of the nature natural or oh, nature way of things going what do you think? Look, I think I think it's probably a, a bit of both. I think the the key question really is um, short term: how do we prepare for it, uh, and then yes. making sure you can do some of the simple stuff, but also uh, long term councils and governments, um, uh, communities, and and individuals have to think about how they um, are going to live their lives in the future, where we develop. Um, uh, you know, housing in the future, um, uh, you know, thinking smart about where we put them. Um, is, uh, some of the, the, the new thinking and or, or thinking that's been on, going on for some time. Yes. Um, but just embedding that um, amongst people and amongst communities is obviously something that we're trying to, the, the best, our best to do. Is the government going to have to put a lot more money into the local governments to help them build up the sea walls and things like that? I think certainly the challenge around infrastructure is uh, is how we do that. Um, you know, at the beginning of the year we had a storm in the Coromandel which caused damage um, on the west coast in Punakaki uh, with Cyclone Fehi, um, Kaikoura, um, our own Centennial Highway. I think, you know, making sure we've got uh, wise investments in the right places um, with some of our roads and infrastructure, um, you know, and, and thinking, you know, and we used to prepare for uh, once and. 30, 40 or 50 year yes. um, incidents um, but um, as we see now the, the weather can get quite ferocious on a regular basis uh, and making sure we're prepared for that is pretty important that will take investment and I think that, that's some of the discussions that we're uh, having um, constantly with local government um, I've met with quite a few uh, mayors and chief executives over the last uh, couple of weeks and um, those are conversations that we're having now it's, um, it's uh, where the risk lies and, and, and how best to do that Yes that's right and uh, we mustn't let our guard down I see a cyclone's forming just uh, south of Fiji at the moment, so it could affect New Zealand's weather over the next, uh, later this week or early next week. So there we are, Chris. That's the good news for you. That's right. Just make sure everyone's prepared. Uh, right. I, I, we're watching that one closely. I don't think it's uh, anything to be overly worried about at the moment. Obviously, we'll keep on that, yeah. uh, in line that with, with see, weather people. Yeah, I see resources for visually impaired and blind New Zealanders a step closer, Mr Farfoy says. What have we done here, Chris? Um, so we basically um, signed up to uh, what's called the Marrakesh Treaty. Um, in essence, it's changing our copyright laws um, so that people um, who are visually impaired um, can get access to the likes of books, and, uh, you know, textbooks. Um, at the moment, yeah, there's restrictions on how much you can translate from uh, a normal book uh, into the likes of Braille because of copyright laws. Um, oh. And that's obviously um, restricts the amount of material that people with uh, vision impairment can get. So um, signing up to this treaty will make it easier um, to do a away with the copyright um, uh, restrictions, um, but also under the current settings, if someone in America um, translates uh, a book uh, into Braille, that can't be brought here. It has to, um, the, the translation has to be done in New Zealand. So changing that law so you can have a bit of trade between countries uh, and these kinds of texts um, is something that will happen under the Marrakesh Treaty as well. So um, this will change the lives of, I think, about 160,000 New Zealanders uh, who have found it difficult in the past to get hold of you know, a simple thing like, um, let's say, Harry Potter, um, because the ability to translate it into Braille or something that is useful for people who are blind or visually impaired um, has been difficult. So the authors are not too concerned about this? 
Or the no, publishers, I should um, say. Uh, the publishers, uh, obviously, um, are worried about copyright um, uh, in, in that context. Um, but what I think is good in this um, respect, and it's been hap- and these negotiations have been happening for many years, is that um, governments. Um, community groups um, representing visually impaired and the publishers and the copyright holders um, have all got together and said okay look um, this is for the good of those uh, who are visually impaired uh, and because of that um, we'll let um, the copyright rules change in order for this community to have access to the material that uh, they think is fair um, and which to be heard they've been waiting for for decades so um, we had a debate in Parliament about the treaty itself, we've got to change the Copyright Act so that will um, happen uh, later this year uh, and then once that's done um, a better access to material for uh, people who are uh, blind or visually impaired um, which can only be a good thing. Mm, so who actually pays? I mean a, a copy of a Braille book they say it costs around about five to six thousand dollars doesn't it so who would pay yeah. for that getting translated um well i think the, the the difficulty has been because you haven't been able to um bring a braille translation from let's say again america over to new zealand um uh, that it has been difficult um to bring the price down especially for um uh, new zealanders as well and uh, so hopefully by uh, making uh, a translation a translated version available um, across borders um, and spreading the cost um, that will mean the cost of getting a text for um, let's say a child here uh, in New Zealand is going to come down a lot because you can trade it and uh, available to a bigger audience mm. it will cost money um, but hopefully um, the ability to trade and uh, work across borders will mean that those um, costs can be shared to a, a much wider group and, and bring the cost down for New Zealanders. Fantastic. Now, I see in Potorua, um child abuse is becoming a bit rife down there. What's the story on that one, though, Chris? Look, I, I think, um, unfortunately, um, whether it be Potorua or any other community, um, this kind of thing uh, uh, can rear its ugly head more, more and more often. Um, I know that uh, the police are looking forward to getting um, more resources through the 1,800 um, police officers uh, that we're going to commit there because a lot of those are going to go into um, a community-based work and preventative crime. And I think um, being able to work with families and other organisations in the community to help um, bring out the pressure um, that some of um, uh, that some of these families are feeling uh, and which manifests itself in a whole lot of ways and sometimes it can be child abuse um, will reduce that over time. But it, it's not good to hear. Um, I think, you know, uh, children um, are some of the most vulnerable people in the community and um, no one likes hearing those kinds of headlines. But um, I'm, I'm, I think I'm catching up with uh, the local police uh, in the next uh, 10 days or so. Um, so I hope to get a bit of an update on how that's going. But I think having more police in the community-based um, roles, I think, will help prevent a lot of um, this kind of carry-on in our communities. Yes, yeah. And just finally, I know you're very busy, but thanks for your time. But uh, food parcels, uh, there's a greater demand for food now uh, from the Salvation Army, and etc., than ever before. That's getting bad, Chris. Yeah, it is. I think uh, families uh, have been struggling for some time now and hopefully some of the changes that will come into force later this year with um, increases to um, uh, allowances uh, for families and families with young children will help take some of the pressure off. I know that um, when we attended... um, uh, the company food bank AGM uh, kind of just before the election last year that again uh, the number of families who are going in and receiving their help uh, had gone up um, and that was obviously a difficult year for the company food bank um, because um, they relocated um, and still uh, when they were out of action for a short period of time the numbers went up so um, I think there was some unmet need there as well so it's a concern um, but as I say hopefully um, for those families who are living on the edge financially some of that um, assistance through um, the Ministry of Social Development which will increase uh, later this year will help those families um, just be able to uh, help uh, with the with the food bill and, and importantly um, for the superannuitants with the um, with the power bills as well. Yes, rent increases are the biggest problem though isn't it? I mean you've got to keep a roof over your head, you've got to pay the rent, you haven't got money for food. Yeah, I think um, we've seen in the headlines um, over the last couple of weeks that um, rents in Wellington are almost as bad as uh, those in Auckland. Um, a particular problem with students um, living um, here as well. I think they all got, well, they'll all be entitled to another $50 a week um, in student allowance. But, um, you know, some of these landlords, and most of them are pretty good, but some have just whacked the rent up by $50 a week, which is um, 
uh, obviously not ideal. And, and in fact, I did hear last week of one student who's studying at Victoria has now moved to Waikanae because um, the the rent is more affordable there. But obviously that's a big schlep. Um, but at least he's got the public transport on the train. So I think it's becoming more of an, an issue um, for students and those who are right on the edge in terms of being able to pay and, and afford um, a rent here in Wellington. Perhaps we have to get a university up here, Chris, do you think? <laughs> well, I think um, we've got 50 day up there as, at the moment. Uh, making more services available on the company coast should be a priority for their local MP. Absolutely. All right, Chris, I'll let you get on your way. I do appreciate your call and I hope we can talk to you next week. Thanks, Nigel. Take care. Chris Farfoy. 106.3 BGFM.